Welcome back 4061ers. This lecture will continue our discussion of threads and the pthreads library that's the most common implementation of it on Unix systems. A few logistics items before we get underway. The reading that you'll probably want to be doing is in Stevens and Rago's uh, chapter 11 and 12. This has pretty good coverage of the pthread basics along with some of the associated infrastructure, including things like mutexes and condition variables. Uh, we'll finish out our discussion today of mutexes and then motivate discussion of condition variables for next time. Lab 11, which discussed on Monday the difference between processes and threads, I uh, got relatively good feedback from folks uh, on that, and so don't need to make too many adjustments on that front. There have been several questions about this Worms homework that's ongoing and due this Friday, uh, so make sure to have a look at that and put up any questions. We'll answer them on Piazza, or feel free to stop by office hours Tuesdays, Thursday from 3 to 4 to discuss it. I did manage to post project two uh, recently and look forward to a separate video introducing uh, that project and overviewing it. Uh, I should have that up, maybe not today, but tomorrow sometime. Have a look at the project specification. And if you have questions after viewing the video tomorrow sometime, stop by office hours or put up Piazza questions about it. One of the techniques that is used in Project 2 is so-called multiplexed I.O., in which process has to read from potentially multiple sources and avoid blocking on any of those sources as another may become available first. The poll system call is useful for this. Now, there are alternatives, but poll is a fairly common one to use uh, in modern systems. And I have recently posted a separate video that demos its use where you have a fast and a slow child separately producing outputs. Poll alleviates the need to guess which is ready and instead will provide notification on a series of file descriptors about which of any of them are ready. So a process can block and then get woken up as soon as any of the input sources it's interested in has data available on it. Make sure to have a look there and uh, download and inspect the code as the techniques that are associated with the poll will be useful in the project for the server portion of that. All right, let's get back to business and discuss these threads. We had left off last time uh, surveying some of the aspects that are interesting associated with threads. One of the common reasons that one would introduce threads into a program is in an attempt to achieve better performance, where you'd launch multiple threads that are cooperating on a task. And we discussed briefly uh, this uh, Monte Carlo approach to approximating pi, which involved a whole sequence of threads, each plopping down dots in a unit square, and then determining if the dot that is random selected is within the bounds of this upper quarter circle. Uh, if so, then you increase some count of dots that are within the area of the circle and can therefore calculate later on how many total dots are within the circle versus uh, total points. Uh, that fraction gives an approximation for pi with appropriate uh, arithmetics, with putting down more total dots uh, leading to better and better approximations. So there was nothing inherently sequential about this process. So we could start a whole bunch of threads all laying down dots in here and simultaneously updating the count. Uh, the trouble that we encountered is that even something as innocuous as a global variable uh, that's stored, for instance, at a memory address 1024, if multiple threads are attempting to increment it, this isn't an atomic operation. And so as we would see each thread executing, the ideal behavior is it loads this variable from global memory, increments it and stores it back. But this process can be interrupted so that as a thread loads, another thread also simultaneously loads, leading to missed hits. Uh, and we observed this, that the approximations, as you would start four threads running on this, uh, would actually be quite bad, uh, that not a good estimate for pi at all. Uh, to that end, one needed to introduce some control mechanisms, and the mutex is the control mechanism that is most commonly associated with coordinating threads. It's shared a lot in common with the uh, semaphores that we've discussed later and will underscore and cement that similarity uh, later on in this lecture. Generally, a thread would call this pthread mutex lock, uh, do its critical region, and then unlock it down here with the responsibility of initializing that mutex falling to some main thread that does so before any of the worker threads fire up. One could then easily surround the critical region here, which is just the increment of this global variable, with a mutex lock and unlock. 
This will uh, ensure that you get correctness, uh, but we saw that the great cost that we pay here is this great amount of contention over those locks. And so as all of the four threads are competing for locks, uh, our performance just goes down the drain. Uh, that the locking and the unlocking become the central kind of air quotes work that's being done by these uh, uh, threads. And our drive towards performance is thwarted there. So this just involved a little reformulation uh, to use a little bit more memory uh, that each thread would independently in its own stack count how many hits it gets and then exactly once at the end of this process uh, lock the global count add on its own number of hits and unlock it the redu reduction here in contention for locks uh, led to proper performance in this case uh, so that we get near linear scale uh, that as i would use two or four or eight threads uh, i get progressively half a quarter and an eighth of the time it takes for the serial version uh, to work and uh, this is then near uh, perfect scalability and what we sort of desire. You'll see this trade off a lot that in order for threads to actually give performance, you'll need to do some amount of splitting up of the data uh, that they modify so that they each have their own private copies of it. And generally then uh, by paying a little bit more in data or sometimes a lot more in data, uh, you can get better performance versus if you want to reduce your data overhead, uh, then you'll probably have to suffer in performance in some way. Classic trade-off in computing, not just pertinent to uh, parallel processing in this case, uh, but all sorts of different realms. The next step that we want to come along this lines is just to discuss a little bit about the semantics and operating system support uh, for these mutexes. So consider the following program. Uh, in the main thread down here, we are going to initialize a mutex and have two different threads created that are going to compete for it. The main thread simply waits for both those threads to finish uh, and then gets rid of uh, anything else that is uh, cleaned up. The worker threads themselves start life in this do it function. Uh, that's evidenced here by do it being passed in as one of the arguments to the two p thread create calls. And all these thread workers are going to do are to lock down the global ver uh, uh, mutex, uh, double this glob global variable, and then sleep for a moment uh, before unlocking and proceeding. Now, what we'd want to sort of study here, interestingly, is what is the total runtime for this program? As the main thread starts up two threads that are going to do something and then sleep for a short time. And what is the total CPU time that is utilized by these? There are two main alternatives uh, that are worth sort of considering, and they have to do with what the underlying behavior of these locking and unlocking operations are. Uh, the first is a so-called busy waiting scheme in which as a thread attempts to lock uh, the mutex here, uh, it could potentially get it and move immediately ahead uh, to perform whatever computation is in here, in this case, doubling a variable and sleeping. But only one of the two threads is going to get this mutex at a time. The other one is going to have to wait in some way, shape, or form uh, for the other to finish its business. And this gets to then what the form of waiting is associated with mutexes. Uh, one is a so-called busy waiting in which uh, the thread that doesn't have the lock, that is waiting on the lock, uh, is constantly checking whether it is available. Uh, this can be implemented in some sort of a tight loop uh, and could be done in the operating system or potentially in user space. Uh, but generally we think of this mutex lock as some sort of a system call, so it's the OS acting on this behalf. Uh, to that end, a busy lock would take quite a bit of CPU. The alternative is that there's this notion of an interrupt driven uh, process uh, that we've seen the operating system support uh, that as you would execute this system call and the kernel would determine, oh, some other thread or entity has this uh, mutex locked already, you can't have it. It would instead put this process to sleep in some way, uh, and in this case, rather, process, I mean thread, as in pause this thread uh, and only put it back into the run queue once the lock becomes available. Uh, so these two operations, uh, they have a sort of um, several monikers associated with them. I'll generally just try to revert to them as busy and uh, uh, not busy uh, or blocking sort of behaviors. Uh, but interrupt driven is one sort of term associated with this non-busy uh, versions and uh, put me to sleep and interrupt that sleep once uh, something comes available. And there's this moniker uh, of polling associated with the busy waiting. 
feel like this is a little bit uh, disingenuous because uh, the poll system call that uses uh, allows you to be notified when one of several input sources uh, is available actually is a non-busy waiting. It puts a process to sleep until something happens on one of the file descriptors it indicates it wants uh, notification about. But generally out there in the literature, polling means checking on something, and in a lot of cases, this means busily checking, as in constantly going into a tight loop where you're checking, is the mutex available? Nope. Is it now available? Nope. Is it now available? Uh, if you've seen old Simpsons clips, uh, this is uh, the are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet uh, scene. So at any rate, uh, we want to know uh, in utilizing mutexes, which of these two behaviors uh, one is going to expect to encounter. And you can discern this from the timing for this. Uh, to lay that out, uh, you'd want to sort of take a moment to predict if this was busy waiting, how long would this take and how much CPU time would I eat up? Versus if this is the interrupter, non-busy sorts of waiting as you would lock things down, how long would this process take? Uh, so take a moment, just think that over, and then we'll walk through it together in just a moment. That should be long enough for you to pause and contemplate if you're so inclined, and if you're in a hurry to just get to the spoilers, here's how one would reason about it. So the main pro thread here, main process, is going to wait for both threads uh, to complete. Uh, both threads at some point are going to sleep for one second. So I'd expect the total runtime, the total wall time that I've observed uh, for this, is going to be about two seconds, as in the main process is going to start up nearly instantaneously, these two threads, wait for them uh, to finish, and nearly instantaneously finish up. Uh, thread one will sleep for a second after locking it, and then finish. Uh, that means while thread one is sleeping, the other thread is waiting on the lock, and when it gets it, uh, the second thread to get it will also sleep for a second, uh, leading to a runtime of two seconds. Now, what we're really interested in is what happens in terms of CPU utilization for the thread that doesn't get the lock. So pretend for a moment the first thread that starts up uh, likely gets the lock locked down. It sleeps for a second. Sleeping is an act of just taking yourself off the scheduled run uh, uh, sort of entities by the operating system for a second. This consumes no CPU time for the sleeping thread. Uh, however, if the thread that is uh, blocking or sort of attempting to lock this thing waits in a busy fashion, then you could expect for that entire uh, second that thread one is sleeping, thread two is using CPU time as it tries to acquire this lock busily. On the other hand, if this is a non-busy wait, more the interrupt-driven style down here, then you'll expect the second thread, uh, which doesn't get the lock, gets put on hold and similarly just gets pulled out of the run queue by the operating system and put on hold until the lock actually becomes available. So in the case of busy waiting, I'd expect there to be a full second of CPU time here while the uh, late thread here is busily waiting on that lock, versus if it's not busy locking, uh, then I'd expect there to be almost no CPU time utilized by this. So uh, we can uh, fire this thing up and run it. Uh, this is coming from the code uh, let's see, p thread, uh, or sorry, say time mutex over here. Uh, so let me come over and GCC time mutex.c, uh, ah, and we'll get uh, a bunch of undefines because uh, as I am compiling with pthreads, I always have to remember uh, to link in the pthreads library. This will produce an a dot out, and I'll importantly want to time this. And if you're not familiar with the time utility, do a little background reading. It reports several times associated with the program run that we'll outline presently here. Uh, the first is the wall clock time, as in how long did I have to wait, uh, and if I were to run this again, I'd count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, and I'm done. So our prediction of this taking about two seconds of real time was about accurate. But you can see in the next two steps our CPU time used uh, from the user program and on behalf of it by the kernel. And these are very negligible. Uh, that it took me almost zero time of user time and very negligible amount of system time here uh, to execute, uh, which lends some credence to the hypothesis that these locks here are non-busy, uh, that uh, the attempt to lock something that is already possessed by a different thread will put this thread to sleep until the OS detects uh, this thread is waiting on this lock and that lock's now available. I'll put that thread back into the run queue to contend for it. 
So uh, this then uh, speaks to the efficiency of mutexes that like semaphores, they have associated with them a weight queue of some sort that folks that are attempting to lock down something that is not available uh, get put on hold. And so have uh, mutexes and have very good operating system support and are generally efficient to use. They have a counterpart, something called a spin lock that comes from the pthreads library. And this is uh, the true uh, sort of busy waiting scheme uh, that uh, you would expect that instead of calling pthread mutex lock up here uh, and making use of pthread mutexes, instead you can replace these with spin locks. And this is done in the time spin lock.c program. Uh, let's pull that up just quick. Uh, it's in the code pack for today here, time spin lock, uh, and sort of gives an overview of of uh, their use, which is identical to uh, the mutex locks, uh, mutexes in, in general, and that you have a lock and an unlock operation on here, you have an init and a destroy uh, versions, the uh, kinds of uh, options associated with spin locks are just slightly different than pthreads, but largely the drop-in of replacement for it. Uh, the one thing that changes though is the underlying behavior and how the OS supports this is that spin locks really do spin. They go into a tight loop as you're trying to lock something, and if you don't get it, then you burn quite a bit of CPU. So let me, uh, let's see if I can uh, orient this right. I'm gonna move my shell like over here just a little bit. I gotta compile this thing uh, and I'll time this uh, with the spin lock uh, version. Okay, uh, so that's compiled uh, and I need a top uh, to be present at the moment. Uh, so let me fire this thing up and put it over here. I'll do a top over here. Uh, some of the CPU activity comes from uh, my using uh, this uh, rec screen recording uh, system. Uh, so I ignore that for the moment and instead look for the CPU for it to spin up quite fast uh, for a moment. I'm gonna time this thing, the spin lock version. And yeah, you see it uh, jump up here for a moment. Uh, and instead of getting uh, sort of almost no neg negligible uh, user time here, I got a full second of utilization. And that's on account uh, of one of the threads that comes into this region up here is going to lock the spin lock and be able to move immediately forwards to modify the global variable and sleep. The other thread that follows shortly after is going to attempt to lock and the lock's no longer available. So it's going to sit there utilizing CPU time uh, and spinning uh, while the other lock or the other thread just sleeps for a moment. Uh, the cost of this then is CPU time, but you do then uh, get sort of fast faster access to the uh, lock uh, than would you would be if you're subjecting yourself to the scheduler. Uh, to that end, then there are a few real-time situations in which you might want to use spin locks where CPU time isn't really an issue. Instead, you, it's much more important that you acquire a lock uh, faster. But those are few and far between, and you'll probably be aware of them as you would come into them, uh, having to do with more real-time systems where it's very critical that you move through a region as fast as possible. Uh, so generally, don't make use of spin locks unless you can think of a really good reason not to make use of it. Uh, you'll generally get better CPU utilization uh, through the use of mutexes. There are a few gotchas that uh, Bear mentioned. Uh, these came up in discussion with folks during um, uh, the lecture discussion in office hours uh, over the last couple days. Uh, so I'm glad that folks are thinking about these things. Generally using mutexes is a little bit dangerous, just as using semaphores was a little bit dangerous. Uh, you have to choose your protocol carefully to ensure that folks that are competing for mutexes uh, do so uh, according to a protocol that guarantees there won't be any deadlock uh, that arises. Um, so for instance, if a thread attempts to lock a mutex a second time, as in I acquire the lock, and then at some point in my code, I call mutex lock on the same thing again, this can actually cause deadlock to occur. Uh, POSIX mutexes are aware of this sort of phenomena and it can be set in various ways to fail out uh, or increment some counter indicating how many times you've locked it. Uh, this can have applications uh, generally, but you should know what you're doing in that front and test thoroughly. 
Uh, importantly, then, uh, the same thing that can happen with uh, semaphores uh, can happen as well, uh, that if two folks uh, both lock uh, a mutex, uh, or sorry, two folks are both trying to lock the same mutex uh, and they go in the wrong order, uh, you can get uh, some sort of deadlock that results. So there's nothing inherently more safe about mutexes than semaphores in that front. All of the concurrency issues and potential for deadlock can arise here as well. In addition to potentially uh, deadlocking if you block twice or otherwise sort of misbehave on that front. There's some notable instances of this happening. And if you have access to the Robinson Robinson's optional sort of side textbook on this, uh, this uh, advanced uh, or this, uh, uh, I forget what it is, is that a practical Unix programming or something like that. They outlined this interesting scenario uh, a few years back in which the Mars Pathfinder probe, uh, which was designed by NASA to land on Mars uh, and do exploratory research. Uh, its underlying code that controlled the hardware had featured a bunch of threads with different priorities and that would lock different portions of the hardware as it was needed for the various experimentations and maintenance routines that or, uh, existed on the probe. Unfortunately, uh, the fine folks at NASA and putting together this very complex system uh, encountered some difficulties on this uh, and that the multiple threads that were there that they had different priorities that had to do with how critical different systems and activities were about to maintaining the probe. Uh, shortly after landing, uh, the robots started rebooting like crazy uh, and NASA engineers were going out of their minds trying to figure out why this multi-million dollar piece of hardware was malfunctioning so badly. And eventually, with copies of the code locally, they were able to trace this down and replicate the problem as having to do with a short-lived low-priority thread, uh, which would lock a mutex, uh, but then get preempted by a long-running medium-priority thread uh, that also wanted this mutex and couldn't acquire it because of the short-lived sort of uh, priority thread uh, having it. And the interruption of this uh, early thread by the later thread, uh, it didn't cause this thread to release the mutex. It's caused the system to freak out uh, and uh, nothing to sort of go well. And built in was this safety critical measure that if things seem really, really bad, just reboot the system. Unfortunately, you start rerunning the same buggy code. Now, if I remember right, uh, the folks, the NASA engineers were eventually able to remotely patch uh, code. But you can imagine this was a hair raising uh, sort of effort that the last thing you want to do is to transmit code to the rover uh, the, or the um, um, probe that uh, would brick that machine when it's on a different planet. Um, so you can imagine uh, folks were upset by this problem the first time and freaked out by the, uh, the solution to it, which was to change the firmware on this, this rover on the fly. But they were able to get it working again uh, and learned a valuable lesson about the use of mutexes and threads and coordination and how you don't touch that thing with a 10-foot stick unless you're really, really certain and can do a lot of testing to make sure things won't go sideways. We'll touch on that point again later on as we discuss the appropriate uses for threads as we go forwards. Next, though, um, we want to draw some of the contrasts and similarities uh, between mutexes because we've observed this stuff uh, in, with respect to semaphores, and I think it's worthwhile to hit explicitly on some of uh, their uh, similarities and differences. So generally, they both have the same place in the world, which is to coordinate the use of shared resources between multiple acting entities. Uh, it's the case, though, that semaphores are more oriented towards inter-process communication uh, and uh, coordination between multiple processes. This is evidenced by the fact that when you create a semaphore, it has this sort of global name in the uh, IPC space, that when you create it, it has this sort of uh, quoted name that's a string that has some backslash associated with it, and all multiple processes have to do to get access to it is to know that string name. Mutexes, on the other hand, as they're used commonly, they're mainly oriented towards thread coordination. And this is evidenced by the fact that when you create a mutex, it's created in, within the memory that is associated with a single process. And for a second process to get access to that mutex, it takes some more work. Uh, that you can actually arrange for this, uh, that if you plop the mutex down within a uh, shared block of memory and initialize it with the right options, that it can be treated as shared between multiple processes. 
and uh, private uh, semaphores uh, can be made private so that uh, only a single process is using it to coordinate things like threads within it. Uh, you can set options associated with the semaphores uh, to make this happen. But generally the thrust of semaphores is toward inter-process uh, coordination and the thrust of mutexes is towards thread coordination within the same process. Both of them we've seen then feature this uh, non-busy waiting set of semantics uh, that as a process would attempt to acquire a semaphore uh, and that semaphore is not available then it blocks and so too as a thread would attempt to acquire a, a mutex then if that mutex is not available the thread blocks and so no additional CPU resources are utilized because the operating system supporting and recognizing these toward coordination mechanisms if something tries to lock it and it's not available then it gets just put on hold uh, going into the non-runnable queue in the OS tables. And when that entity, semaphore or mutex, becomes available, uh, then the process or thread is unblocked, put back in the run queue, and scheduled by the processor. A couple sort of low-level differences then are that semaphores can generally hold an arbitrary natural number. Uh, zero tends to mean locked and a value of one means available, but you can actually initialize semaphores to have values like two, three, four. Generally this is associated with multiples of a resource being available, so if there are three of you know, uh, widgets available and uh, you want to uh, sort of limit the uses of them, you could establish a semaphore with a value of three. Every time one of the uh, process comes along and wants to lock it, it will decrement uh, that semaphore. And having no widgets left is essentially, there's nothing less than anyone else that will come along and wants a widget uh, would block on attempting to lock it. I don't know of too many practical situations where you actually have this sort of replicated resource uh, that allows uh, several processes to enter a critical region. Uh, instead, usually when I think of replication, this would be like you have uh, two different database file descriptors or two different printers, uh, and you would actually want to lock one or the other of them. Uh, that uh, semaphore that counts as two doesn't actually sort of make sense in that uh, situation. Uh, so we won't actually see any examples where we utilize that facility of semaphores, but it does exist. And so if you encounter a situation where that'd be appropriate, uh, then do reconsider uh, and use that facility of semaphores. Mutexes, on the other hand, don't have any counting semantics associated with them. Uh, they're just treated as either locked uh, or unlocked, uh, not available or available, uh, and so aren't usually appropriate to use associated with a counting value. Uh, but you can recreate the magic of a semaphore there uh, by having a mutex associated with a global variable that just counts, um, so that's possible uh, through combination then. Finally, uh, unlike semaphores, mutexes do have this busy locking variant, uh, the spin lock that is present in most pthread implementations. And we discussed earlier, if you find yourself in a situation where you think you might need uh, such a thing, uh, then it is available uh, to coordinate threads uh, using this busy locking or polling semantic. All right, so if you have further questions about similarities and differences between semaphores, uh, please do uh, chime in uh, during lecture discussion uh, or during office hours. But there are, are a lot of sort of shared uh, sort of uh, notions between these two. And a sort of pointed question one person asked me is, why is it that both exist if there's so much similarity between them? Why not just sort of settle on one? And this is an example, I believe, that stems from uh, computing systems not being built in isolation, that instead, uh, throughout the development of our young field, folks have tried different things. Some of it has worked out and others of it hasn't. Uh, and we touched on this a little bit in discussion of semaphores that there were actually two major implementations of semaphores out there, the older System 5 semaphores and tied up with them in that System 5 IPC. There is an alternate version of shared memory and an alternate version of uh, the message queues. There's also a POSIX implementation of it that we covered in great detail in lecture. Uh, and folks sort of would ask, why are there two versions of this? Well, uh, folks uh, at first gas weren't sure how to implement or what kinds of primitives would be necessary in those situations. And so they built this POSIX uh, or this uh, System 5 version, uh, learned a bunch of things about how they would be used and better ways to provide those facilities, and therefore went on to provide a uh, more recent version, uh, which changed things to how folks typically used it in the POSIX version make it more convenient and more reliable and easier to implement on the OS side. 
Uh, so too, threads didn't always exist out there. And so as folks came online, uh, they saw a lot of similarities between what a thread can provide to what a process can provide, uh, but decided that they would slightly change the semantics associated with semaphores to provide these mutexes instead. It could be that some of the early versions of mutexes uh, actually had busy waiting semantics associated with them, that they didn't have this blocking semantics. And it's only later on that that was introduced through operating system support. Uh, at any rate, uh, in the modern era, it's sort of right to look back and see like we probably only need one of these things with a few uh, versions to or options to invoke it to be coordinating processes versus uh, threads. But the fact that no one was really sure how to do this right at the beginning meant there were lots of attempts and thrusts at it. And what we have now is some collection of our best approximation for that and also some historical relics on that front. Generally, if you're an operating system implementer and you want to support something like POSIX threads and POSIX uh, semaphores, then you'll probably try to do so in as smart and lazy a fashion as possible uh, by coding that stuff up with the same underlying uh, operating system mechanisms uh, that both a semaphore that causes uh, someone to wait if it's not available and a mutex that causes a thread to wait if it's not available, uh, then they both utilize the same underlying mechanism in the operating system, uh, the running queue and the blocked queue uh, and some of the sort of same underlying hardware systems that allow atomic operations to check and set uh, various uh, pieces of memory. Uh, so if you're an OS implementer, probably these two things, uh, you try and get as much shared structure as possible in their implementation, which is why from the outside they look very similar to each other. Uh, all right, let's move ahead and uh, discuss a few other aspects of threads, including uh, motivating one other piece of coordination uh, machinery that we'll need. Um, first, one of the things that we noticed right off the bat is that threads look very much like processes. And we established early on that processes have a unique ID associated with them uh, that the operating system knows about. This isn't quite as true when it comes to threads, that the pthreads library provides the notion of an identifier of some kind, uh, achievable uh, through a call to pthread self here. But technically speaking, you are not supposed to actually do anything with this except compare it to other thread IDs using equality not, or some other stuff like that. Uh, and so the top quote up here, which comes from an interesting Stack Overflow discussion of this, uh, is that uh, if you wanted some sort of an identifier that's unique and simple associated with threads, uh, in a lot of cases, you're um, supposed to provide that for yourself. Uh, and so uh, in some implementation of pthreads, uh, you can find this out uh, and it actually devolves down to something a little bit um, simpler. Uh, so for instance, in Linux, this notion of a thread ID is actually equivalent in terms of the data used for it to a PID. Um, and we all know this as more or less a simple integer. And so it's possible to make use of a printf to say, get your thread ID. Uh, and uh, this is a Linux specific system call uh, and then print this out as an integer. This is non-portable code, so if you were to run it on another kind of Unix, there's no guarantee that this system call would exist uh, or run, uh, so your code would be broken on that front. Uh, it's also possible on other uh, systems to, for instance, uh, call this weird get pthread, get thread ID, uh, NP, uh, the NP short for non-portable out there, which may run on some Linux systems, uh, may not, uh, and may run on some Unix systems and may not, and gets you some sort of an integer associated with thread ID. But uh, we'll focus for just a second on, on this interesting facet of Linux systems uh, that, in, in fact, the kernel itself, uh, the Linux system, just represents thread uh, identity using something like uh, an integer uh, that we uh, associated with uh, process IDs. Uh, and looking in the right headers uh, for the Linux implementation of pthreads, you'll find that uh, pthread t is just declared as a long integer or a 64-bit integer on that front. Same same as uh, PID is on that front. Uh, this enables uh, sort of code to run uh, that will print this stuff out. Again, it's not portable. And oftentimes thread IDs are quite large, uh, larger even than uh, process IDs because they're kept to some extent in a separate space. Uh, to give some concreteness to that, uh, pop open this pthread ids.c file with me uh, and I'll do so over here in the editor. 
uh, p threads IDs. Uh, oops, sorry, I misspelled it, but it's right here. Uh, and if you compile and run this thing, it's, uh, IDs dot c and link that uh, p threads uh, library. Let's see, uh, p thread. Sorry, uh, I'm run this thing. Uh, all it's going to do is to print out in the main thread up here uh, what its thread ID is, and then in, in this child thread, print out uh, a thread ID. You can see down here, main says it's this very large uh, uh, ID associated with threads, and this uh, very large ID associated with uh, the child thread here. Uh, these things, uh, you can also actually ask about processing, and I think it's uh, um, worthwhile to maybe to add that in. So I'll uh, get PID here. Uh, I am threaded in PID percent D, uh, and then down here, I am threaded in, in PID percent D. We'll get PID. Okay, and I think I also need to then remember. I think get PID is in Unix standard dot H. Uh, no promises on that front. Hot damn, all right, uh, got it all right. Uh, so you see both these threads exist in the same process ID, but because uh, the kernel is gonna allow multiple threads per process, uh, it starts adopting bigger IDs associated with threads uh, to keep them distinct on that front. So generally then a runnable entity on Unix could be something as small as a thread on that part. And you can have multiple threads per process, each of them working somewhat independently from each other. Uh, to that end, uh, the kernel has to keep track of those correspondences of this runnable entity, which this thread ID has uh, in process such and such, uh, and similarly so for the um, child uh, the threads that uh, come in here. Um, so this is a simple mechanism and I expect a lot of operating systems uh, would make use of such facilities, but we're using Linux suspe uh, uh, specific features here. And so this kind of code, if you were to run it on Mac OS X, I wouldn't necessarily expect it to run the same. Note here, the use of pthread self, uh, this does more or less the same thing uh, and is implemented in Unix, uh, Linux with the system call get TID. Uh, but this implementation may be different of this standard um, library function associated with pthreads on a system like Mac OS X, where it returns actually a struct of some kind uh, that has several pieces of information around what the thread looks like. And therefore printing it out as a long integer wouldn't uh, suffice in this case. So be careful. Uh, there's always going to be a trade-off in this case of simplicity versus portability. And if you are favoring to run your code only on Linux, uh, then expect your job to be somewhat easier because you have a limited target to hit and can make use of these specific calls. However, expect griping from folks who want your code to run on Mac OS X uh, instead, because uh, they're like, it's almost like Unix. If you just fix up these system calls, uh, then we could run it there. And uh, with no appreciation for maybe how difficult it is to write portable code on that front. Uh, Trade-offs as ever there was uh, any. We're gonna conclude our discussion today uh, motivating uh, one additional uh, coordination mechanism called a condition variable by examining the somewhat involved uh, sort of model problem. This harkens back to stuff that looks sort of like uh, dining philosophers because at initial gasp, this problem is not gonna look like it has many practical utilities we'll draw a more canonical problem that is sort of practically useful uh, later on in the discussion here. But for a moment, consider the following problem setup. We're gonna have a main thread start up two sets of child threads, so four child threads total. Some of these threads are gonna run a routine called even work, and the other is uh, two are going to run this routine called odd work. The intent here is to increment this global variable count 20 times. The job of even workers is to increment the variable only when it has an even value, and vice versa, the odd workers increment this variable only when it has an odd value. Uh, to facilitate the total count uh, reaching 20, each even worker is going to do some increment five times on this. So uh, as worker one sees, oh, the value in here is zero, I will increment it. Uh, and then I will check the variable again and see, oh, if it's four now, then I will increment it. Uh, and if it checks later and sees, ah, this value is now eight, I'll increment it to nine. 
So we have two competing threads that want to check for the variable being even, and two competing threads that are checking for this thing uh, being odd, and all four of these are competing to check the value of this variable at any given time. What I'd like you guys to do is to take a moment and check on, uh, sort of uh, work through the code for one instance of these workers. Uh, set out where you would need to make use of locking and unlocking this little mutex here that gives control of who has access to the global variable at a given moment. And make sure that whatever code you produce is correct by locking and unlocking the mutex in the right cases. Uh, also, you'll need to use some good old fashioned control structures like if then else's and loops in order that each of these workers, the even worker and the odd worker, does its incrementing five times. With a total of four workers then, we should get 20 increments to this count then. This is a little bit involved, but uh, we'll demonstrate that you understand how to call pthread mutex uh, lock and unlock, and also demonstrate something sort of interesting about this problem, that sometimes when you lock, you find you don't actually want to do something to the variable. Take a moment, think this over, and suss out some code for it. That should probably be long enough for those of you who are interested in practicing to actually go about it. I'm going to speed along uh, and actually look at my version of this code, uh, which looks like the following. I use while loops here, but for loops would probably uh, work just as well on that front. Uh, up top, uh, I am going to work on this even work uh, sort of code, uh, and you should be able to translate fairly readily uh, the pattern layout here to the odd work, uh, and that shouldn't make a, too much of a difference on that front. Um, so the sort of T value of that that's given here, which is some sort of an identity uh, for this uh, worker, doesn't actually matter. It's not used uh, anywhere in here, so you can largely ignore it. Instead, uh, even work is supposed to increment only uh, when uh, there's an, the count is even, this global variable. And so what we'll find is uh, the main pattern here is to lock down this global variable so nobody changes it. Uh, and this will put the worker on hold as it tries to increment until it actually gets exclusive access through uh, acquiring this lock. And then there's a check. Uh, if this count is even, uh, then I'll increment the count and also increment my iteration count on this. Importantly, the while loop here isn't going to increment each time. Uh, instead, if I lock down this count variable and find that, oh, uh, it's not actually even, it's odd, then I should bypass this, unlock it, uh, loop back around, and try to lock again in case so one of the odd workers has acquired it with a value of one and moved it back into the even realm here. So the while here uh, looks innocuous at first, that maybe I could replace it with a four, uh, but importantly, it reflects the fact that each time I loop through this thing, I may not actually have success, uh, that this is somewhat indefinite because I lock, find it's odd, and don't do anything except to unlock. Loop back around, second time I lock it and find that, oh, uh, I also missed it because it's three now. Uh, and loop back around, and the next time I check, it's still three. Loop back around, next time I check, it's five. So I'm not actually incrementing my uh, sort of iteration count at all. It stays at zero here. This is a subtle issue uh, that he speaks uh, one of the facets we need to discuss, uh, which is uh, this notion of the condition that I want to have true as I acquire this lock. Right now, this work that's done here will only happen if the count variable itself uh, is uh, even. And to that end, sometimes that I lock uh, the global variable here uh, are, and acquire that lock are sort of useless, that I'll do uh, the lock and then find that there's nothing to be done because the value is even, and essentially do nothing, that my acquiring of this lock was wasted on account of uh, I needed to acquire the lock to check this thing only to find that it's not uh, an, in a condition that I can do anything with it. Um, this leads to some contention for locks that's artificial and could be made unnecessary uh, if we had some other scheme that allowed this thread to wake up and get the lock only on the condition that it is even. And this will motivate then uh, this other piece of machinery, the condition variable uh, that is associated with that. Uh, we will pick up next time a discussion uh, of condition variables, but I think we've made sufficient progress for the moment. Generally, they're going to solve this problem of wanting to acquire something only under circumstances uh, that's uh, 
uh, have to do with some state that it's in. Uh, and this will lead to better sort of management of those uh, locks and uh, better overall efficiency in systems that need coordination. I'll leave off there for the moment and look forward in the next day or so to a complimentary video to this lecture discussion that surveys what Project 2 is about and demonstrates some of the facilities that are present in there. Hope everyone is happy and healthy, and until we meet again online, happy hacking.